Yes. Okay. Complex divide. Oftentimes when I talk to people about this, they go, complex numbers? What? Yeah, I remember that from class, but when people use them, it turns out complex numbers are used with analysis of almost anything with waves, fluid dynamics, electrical engineering, studies of protein structures, quantum mechanics, that means MRI, CT scanners, and lots of other areas. It's usually hidden under the covers. Ordinary people or you know, the people aren't doing the technical work, never see it. But it's important to get it right. So when I started this study, I discovered that complex divide glitched and failed much more often than you would like, as we'll see in a little bit. I mean, just got completely wrong answers. So here's the naive formula, uh, what somebody might use if they just looked it up in a textbook and implemented it directly. A complex number has a real and imaginary part. So if you take throughout this talk, I'll be using A plus BI as the numerator and C plus DI as the denominator, where I is, of course, the square root of minus one. Uh, so uh, you have a, a computation of that combines all four of the real numbers to compute a, uh, a new real number and a new imaginary number. The important part to note here is we've got C squared plus D squared. If C or D is large, that is even as large as the square root of the largest possible number, you get an overflow. Not good. But that's all right. We, we understand that. And way back over 50 years ago, Richard Smith uh, developed the method widely used, in fact, used by GCC up until this spring that said, figure out which is the bigger of C and D and divide that one out. And pretty straightforward, works well. Uh, well, it works well as long as your numbers are not too big. Let's uh, move on. I found bases, cases where it did not work, wanted to do something better, had the good fortune to have on hand the Mathematical Function Computation Handbook by Beebe. This thousand plus page tome talks about all sorts of things. If you want to do mathematical work, I highly recommend this uh, book as a place to see what's going on as of just a few years ago. And it describes four newer methods of doing complex divide in addition to Smith's formula. The C99 style scales by a power of two uh, of the nearest power of two to the maximum of C and D, similar to Smith's method for er its error rate, mostly reduces underflow and overflow. Doug Priest had a different method uh, where he tested exponents, and if they were found to be too big or too small, he would scale. It seemed very promising to reduce the problems I was running into, but further investigations found it was not uh, it was better, but not substantially better than the C99 scout. A different paper that doesn't seem to have been implemented anywhere was by Stewart, and it added several uh, tests against value size. Anytime three numbers were multiplied together in the formula, it would test to find which was the biggest, which was the smallest, multiply those two together, and then multiply the medium sized afterwards. That actually got a substantial improvement. Factor of 50 fewer uh, failures when you've got extreme values. And finally, he had Smith's method, a Bowden and Smith's method, and that turns out to be the same Richard Smith. This paper was published in 2012, 50 years after Richard Smith's original paper. It does a test of that ratio we saw in Smith's method for zero. If you see a zero there, unless one of your input values is zero, that's probably an underflow. And his, this revised method is you reorder the computation, and it's less complicated than Stewart's method. Uh, just doing that alone 
get you almost as good a results as Stuart's method. And I saw some opportunities for further improvements. So. Everything else in this talk will be based on the Bowden and Smith method plus further improvements. Early exploration was based on a manual creation of a test case. I just manually created over 100 different tests to say what was going on and what was going wrong. But that approach, I finally realized, was just way too limited and biased. If you uh, were working on a particular solution, a particular method, you might uh, fall into a mindset of, oh, these are the specific kinds of things that causes this method trouble, and you wouldn't necessarily test issues that caused other methods trouble. You wouldn't have a good overall solution or overall test to say one method was better than another. So I, I stepped back and I created a random number generator based on random, but then um, multiple calls to random to generate a, a full exponent a fully random exponent and a fully random mantissa, uniformly distributed over the whole range. Uh, the primary tests then were used to generate 10 million pairs of complex values. All the test results I'll be showing are based on that random number generator. I, uh, in those tests, I first eliminated uh, the, the values that could not get a result that was uh, representable. I used quad precision arithmetic to test that out. And that meant I was eliminating the, the obvious overflows when the numerator was very small or, or very large and the denominator uh, was not sufficient to bring it down to a representable range. Uh, Bowden and Smith also had a random number generator, but they didn't uh, publish exactly what their random number generator uh, did, so mine's a little bit different. And my method showed higher error rates than Bowden and Smith's. I consider that a, a good thing because it puts more stress and more likely to find flaws. For the later on in the presentation, I'll be showing some specific floating point numbers. They're presented in hex float format. That's the percent A. This format lends itself to seeing specific interesting bit patterns and exponents. The exponent shown is uh, two to whatever that number is. That's a uh, decimal number, like two to the plus 1,023 uh, would be shown as plus 1,023. The exponent, I mean, that's the exponent. The mantissa is shown in hex format which means if you've got a series of zeros, uh, they show up exactly in the appropriate bit positions. And it's easy to see uh, differences just by inspection between two different values. And I'll be showing comparisons of quad precision versus our new values. All right, this is maybe a little hard to read because of uh, slide space limitations. I'm only showing the case where D is larger than C. So uh, as before, we compute the ratio, we compute the dominator. This is the new, new feature. If the ratio is not equal to zero, then uh, good, we don't have a problem. We use the same method as before. If it was equal to zero, now instead of using the ratio, we change those three values that were used and divide A by D instead of C by D, and then multiply by the remaining uh, value. This is essentially what, uh, what Stewart's method was doing in a special case. And it's simpler because it only requires one test. You only have to test again ratio being zero. So what, uh, what does that do? Here's our initial results. For convenience, I am limiting the report to what I consider, I've called them different things, but I'll say today, gross errors, 
more than 20 bits are wrong. Out of 52 bits of possible mantissa precision, when you've got more than 20 bits wrong on a single calculation, it doesn't take much to see that pretty soon you're just going to get wrong answers all through your application. They won't show up as not a number or infinities. They'll just be wrong. And you won't get any faults. You won't get any notice. You'll just silently get wrong answers. So Smith's method showed out of 10 million tests, more than 1% were wrong, grossly wrong. Uh, this simple basic method of Bowden and Smith uh, shows a better than five times improvement. In the paper that I uh, show reference at the end, of the uh, Bowden and Smith's full method includes a couple of more uh, modifications beyond the basic method, but the paper does not detail them. So I had to go forward on my own to find further improvements. I used an experimental method. Rather than going back to pure theory, I examined the input values that failed and looked at each of the intermediate calculations to identify sources of failure. I don't have time in the talk to go step by step for every little detail, but I'll show the major points. Um, once you've looked at a set of input values that are failing, you say, okay, is there something I can do to make this better? Here's a first example, first iteration. Uh, as mentioned before, quad precision, 128 bit. That was convenient. It's nice to have that software package already available in GCC. So, the quad precision for the real part matched exactly. No problem there. But in the imaginary part, that we show in bold here, there's a pretty substantial difference. Well, the key intermediate result is when you compute the ratio, we get a very, very small number. The exponent is at the limit of being the smallest possible exponent, and we don't have a normalized value. So these are called, these numbers that are smaller than uh, double min are called subnormals. Double min is the minimum normalized value available on the hardware. This one's pretty easy to fix. Uh, just instead of testing for zero, test for double min. If ratio is less than a double min, you're going to have lost precision as you shift it down. We have fewer bits of a precision, and that's where we're getting our wrong answer from. Let's look at the result. A, 12 times improvement in the gross errors. Just with that one simple check, no performance loss, because we're still only doing one test. Instead of test for zero, test for double min. Uh, great improvement. Uh, could just stop there, but I felt like we're still getting thousands of errors out of 10 million tests. That'll accumulate to problems sometimes, especially uh, when you're thinking about an iterative method that includes a complex divide step and is looking for values that are very close to zero. You'll get closer and closer until you eventually have a problem. So I kept going. Next iteration. Uh, we have, again, this time, both uh, real and imaginary parts showing problems. And, oh, we've got a very small numerator. Hmm, what's going on with that? Oh, wait, the denominator is also very small. When we have some computing, some intermediate values, again, we have an intermediate computation that is really teeny tiny. Well, I've, this took some fiddling around, exploring, trying different things. I finally came across uh, by sort of trial and error that if I check to see if the largest of C and D were less than double epsilon, uh, which epsilon is the smallest value between one and the next larger representable value. Uh, so it's uh, one, two to the minus 52, basically one bit in the at the end of the mantissa. Just check and see if both uh, C and D are less than that. 
you can scale everything up by one over double epsilon two to the 52nd because you would have overflowed anyway if A and B overflow. So it's only one additional test. Since we already know which of C and D is larger, we only have to test against uh, the remaining or uh, the larger value. So with one additional test, we now reduce our errors down to 100 out of 10 million. That's one out of one out of 100,000. Now I'm feeling like this is good. I could stop here, but let's just see if I can get a little further. I look at another one. I get a sample failure of. Well, we again have a subnormal input value causing trouble. And. Um, no value is too big. So if we uh, just again scale everything up, uh, then uh, it saw it uh, makes the problem go away. So if a is too big, and b is r max two is a value that if uh, a value is, if all values are less than r max two, you can multiply by one over uh, double epsilon and it will still be a representable value. So just do this test. This is a more complicated test. However, because double min is so small, these tests are very rarely um, taken. You, with a good branch predictor, it costs only one or two cycles and gives you, eliminates uh, you know, the additional wrong answers. We scale it up. Now we're down to just four errors. Oh, wow, we're almost done. Again, could stop here, but well, let's see what we got. Is it something that is fixable pretty easily? Uh, here was a sample failure. Ooh, look at that number. One FF 1023. 1023 is your biggest possible exponent. 1FF is just really near to being not representable. So it turns out that the denominator, when you compute it, uh, exceeds double max. Again, a very simple test. If the larger of C and D is greater than double max divided by 2, scale A, B, C, D down by 2. You don't need this test also. Almost always succeeds, costs very little in the overall performance. And our final result, we're down to zero test failing out of 10 million. OK, zero. Well, maybe I just got lucky. I cranked up the test run from 10 million to 1 billion, and I still got zero failures, zero gross failures. There's still some issues, but are we done? Maybe pretty close. Let's see. Now I'm going to shift over to looking at not just the gross errors, which is line 20 here, but what about lesser errors? And also I've just included for convenience the totally wrong answers. Smith's method, the current method in use, has 1% totally wrong answers when you're looking at the full range of possibilities. Bowden and Smith, much, much better. Uh, and, of course, the new method gets zero. Two-bit errors, okay, we still get a few, but you might expect that if you're going to have to multiply and divide and add and subtract, you accumulate a little bit of the way in errors. Uh, Four-bit errors, again, that's not too surprising. Uh, we have a very few cases of more than that. That happens when you get catastrophic subtraction when B times C and A times D, which you then subtract, when they're very nearly equal, it's easy to lose precision. And the easy answer is, when that case happens, ideally you'll run it in a higher precision if you have higher precision hardware. But this is the point where I said, it's time, it's time to, well, one final test. Before that, sorry, before that, how much slower is it? We've added a number of branch tests. 
and the relative slowdown, now this is on older x86 and older ARM processors, newer ones will do a little better because they have better branch predictors. That's something that the hardware guys are always pushing. So the different hardware will have different slowdowns. The main point is it's not an extreme overhead. When you take into account that jumping up to quad precision is in software is perhaps a thousand times slower this is not that. Uh, applications that are absolutely performance sensitive and absolutely want the fastest possible complex divide can use GCC compile time switches to select faster but less accurate methods. Uh, not recommended in my mind, but it's, it's an option. Now finally, oops, there's something there, that's what I'm missing. Okay, this slide. Bowden and Smith included 10 what they called difficult values. Uh, the specifics, you can look up their paper and, and get the exact values. The important point is the naive method failed on all 10 of these. Smith method, um, well, 53 says you got 53 correct bits. 41 is 41 correct bits, and this one, five correct bits. Zero means completely wrong. Uh, so Smith got these difficult values, about half right. And you can see others got different numbers. If you had picked different values, you would have uh, a different analysis of what the best, re best option is. Uh, interesting to note that Stewart and Bowden and Smith got exactly the same ones right and wrong. And great, oh, I got nine out of 10, but I still got one wrong. What was going on there? Oh, look at this. One times the highest possible uh, exponent plus one times the highest possible exponent divided by one plus one. In computing uh, A plus DI, or when computing this all out, the intermediate computation gets a number that is one bit higher than the maximum possible representation for, uh, and then divides it by two. I could have included one more test to say if A or B, or there would actually take two tests uh, to test for both A and B are larger than some value, then scale down. A little um, analysis that says how frequently that happens is, and my random number generator results suggest it's extremely rare. I decided at this point it was time to ship it, time to get it, uh, the, the dramatic improvement that I'd already gotten into the code base and uh, then consider further improvements. Than the speed test. So a summary of what was done here. And this method could apply to most attempts to improve math libraries. Start with investigation of current work. Don't reinvent the wheel. Maybe somebody else there has a great idea that has just been sitting on the shelf. Bowden and Smith was published in 2012, and yet here we are, it took us eight years to get it into the library. Uh, measure with a wide range of input values. There, uh, if you follow all the links, you will be able to find the test code I used and the random number generator I used. Uh, you may not like it, you may want to adapt your own, but it can give you an interest, some interesting ideas on how to, how to do random number generation for floating point numbers, which isn't discussed very often in most random number generation text. Uh, so, then look and see what's failing. Study what's going wrong. Improve incrementally, repeat. And it won't be as simple as what I presented here. It, it took me months to work through all the possibilities and refine what I was doing to make all of these changes. But while you're making changes, be mindful of the performance impact. If your improved form is too slow, are uh, too difficult to maintain because of the complexity of the code, 
it won't be accepted. It won't be used. And uh, this is kind of tiny print, but uh, upon submission, I was requested to also provide these improvements for other precisions. So float 16, float uh, long double, that is, uh, have all also been improved. After we were fairly far into the review process, I realized if you've got Intel or AMD hardware, or any other platform that has the hardware support for the 80-bit format, you can use that for your intermediate computation with very little loss of performance and get rid of those um, uh, subtraction issues. I'm pretty sure that the Intel compiler does that. And then I have references for people who want to look further. I will upload these slides. I should have done that already. Uh, I'll upload them to the website shortly. And, uh, and, and for each of those other precisions, I had to write different random number generators. So comments, questions? Let's see what, how much time have we got. Oh, my, <laughs> out of time. Yeah, thank you very much, Patrick. We are nearly out of time. There's maybe one or two minutes left. If someone does have a question, please go ahead. I don't see any questions in the chat, so I guess I should turn it over to the next speaker, which turns out to be me. All right. So it turns out you're up on stage right again, uh, Patrick, with your second talk on tuning malloc. So please just go ahead. Let's see, do we, are we on time? Some limitations of tuning glibc malloc. That may not be the best title. We will be talking about malloc and tuning it. Most of the focus here on is emphasize that you can, that it is tunable, and perhaps we should adjust some of the default situations. Malloc and free are widely used in C, well known. It's also used by runtime systems in many other languages, including Java. We want to be efficient. There have been a number of efforts uh, in recent years to make it better, and they, and they have made a difference. But some alternatives, such as JE Malloc and TC Malloc, show better performance on well-known benchmarks such as Spec CPU uh, than the defaults of the standard Malloc. So if you know something about the tunables, you can get better results. Of course, different usage patterns will favor different strategies. Anytime you change a standard library set of defaults, you will affect some applications, and that can be a challenge for deciding whether or not to make a change. So uh, some applications, malloc and free, many small chunks, in a highly variable rate. Others say, give me a chunk of data and I'll keep it for a long time. In addition, internally, malloc, uh, the malloc library uses both sbreak and mmap, and they have different benefits and limitations. There's no best solution. So even if we were to change the defaults, it's helpful to know what your options are if malloc and free are chewing up a lot of your performance. Just a little review, S-Break uh, expands the application data segment and storage is only returned to the system uh, when, with an explicit uh, future S-Break and can only be returned when at, at the very end of the segment. 
even if it's available, you don't want to be calling it for every little bit. You want to wait until you have a big enough chunk to be to justify the system call overhead. That is a tunable parameter of when to do that trim. Now, MBAP uh, obtains at least a page when you map additional memory. Uh, so it's not very appropriate for tiny uh, malloc's. When the corresponding free occurs, all the pages that were allocated by the MMAP are immediately returned to the operating system. So that has much less wasted memory, but it has a much higher system overhead. As for security reasons, the pages are zeroed between each malloc and free, or between each free and the following malloc. So I'm not going to explore all the possible benchmarks or even a, a range of, of benchmarks to uh, demonstrate different possibilities. I'm just going to use a single measurement tool and to show you the benefits that are available in some cases. And remember, your application will be different. So what's best here isn't necessarily best for your application. Turns out the Lib Micro benchmark set has a lot of different tests for a lot of different system calls. And one of those is Malloc. It has many options. For here, I'm going to have a very simple test. 16 identical blocks of memory will be malloc and then freed. So your maximum storage request is 16 times the block size. And then repeat many times to get a, a performance measurement. The block size will be varied from 16 kilobytes up to 32 megabytes. My reasoning is, if you're talking about tiny bytes, uh, tiny malloc's and freeze, you're not going to be uh, invoking the system calls, and that's not what uh, these tunables affect. So we're going to focus on things that are affected by the tunables. Here are the tunables that I found useful. Malloc MMAP max. This is pretty obscure. It's the limit on how many M maps you can have in a single thread, uh, or are actually in your application. The default is 64K. You normally won't want to change this unless you want to totally disable the use of MIM map. Set it to zero to totally disable using M map. Then another uh, item is M map threshold. That sets the limit for when you shift from doing S breaks to doing M maps. So it starts out at 128K. And according to some in internal estimates, it will dynamically adjust. It will not increase past 32 megabytes. So any currently any malloc request for over 32 megabytes will be M mapped. Whatever you set the tunable to. Uh, then, since S break is gets trimmed potentially, there is a trim threshold. It, uh, you can totally disable trimming, in which case you never give back, uh, back your S break memory to the operating system. Its default is 128K. And whenever the end of the free list, uh, the end of the heap on the free list is greater than the trim threshold, then S break is called to give that back to the operating system. All the default values I show above are based on 30, uh, 64 bit environments. 32 bit environments are much smaller and have address space limitations. Uh, if you have serious malloc issues in those environments, well, you have, you have other questions. Uh, for my later slides, I shorten the names uh, because it just feels, takes up too much slide space. It's important to notice the trailing underscore in those environment variables. If you don't include the trailing underscore, you will not be affecting malloc. Uh, that was just a little oversight that I made in my early testing. I thought I'd pass that on. All right. Um, let's suppose we increase MMAP uh, from uh, its default all the way up to its maximum of 32K. Uh, I'll be showing variations on this chart all along. 
the blue line you can barely see under the orange line is what happens with the default. The orange line is on top of it. This is the number of microseconds per malloc averaged over the whole run. For 16K, it's fairly quick because you can do a number of mallocs before you actually uh, hit the limit and have to do a system call. So the system call overhead gets spread out. As your blocks get bigger, you have uh, fewer calls to spread that overhead out on. And uh, it shows that what this shows to me is that the dynamic adjustment of the MMAP size for a simple application like this does a pretty good job. Performance is pretty much the same. Next, I went, what happens if we also set trim to 32 megabytes? So we're not trimming back on every 128K. Wow, that's the yellow line. You don't give anything back until we're using 32 megabytes. As long as your total S break size does not exceed 32 megabytes, you don't give it back. That's not a good choice if you've got uh, and a broad application with thousands of threads, each of which use occasionally a large chunk, but then give most of it back, you'll just gobble up all your system memory and run out. On the other hand, if you've got applications that do not have many more threads than processors, say you've got 64 processors and 128 threads, then you will get a big improvement. So each one of these decisions is based on what you care about in your specific environment. Whether you're extremely highly multi-threaded, you're going to find memory as your critical parameter. If your uh, threading is, say, in scientific computing, close to the, uh, the app, um, if the number of threads is close to the number of processors, then you'll want to be more generous in your memory choice, allow they, each thread to gobble up more memory. So next, just disable trimming altogether. Uh, then we, oh, by the way, the bottom line is not actually zero, it's very slightly more than zero, but it means you're not getting any system call overhead. That's uh, when you, if you can get this, uh, if you can get it structured where you're not giving stuff back to your, back to the operating system, you do better. So if we disable trimming, uh, your application will run faster, but it means your S break, your heap, will grow to whatever size it grows to and never give anything back. So it's, it's mostly the reason I ran this test was to see what's the best, what are the limits? And then the final thing is uh, you can't even see it. It's on top of the other colors, but this maroon line, if you disable it all, it it's really going fast. So it looks like the primary component, at least in this kind of a benchmark, for malloc overhead is calling the operating system. You want to, you basically want to identify for your application, what's the threshold? what is your working set for storage you need and set your limits for giving stuff back to that sort of thing. The short answer is pick the right settings, you'll get your better malloc performance. If it's a, an issue, you don't want to be doing all this if malloc isn't where your application is spending time. The current maximum or this is what started me down this, is uh, an application uh, by Root, in fact, the previous presenter, uh, found he wanted to use these tunables. He wanted a higher threshold for MMAP than 32 megabytes because he was running an application that had the same number of threads as processors on a system that had a very large amount of memory, and it just was much too small for that application. So we're investigating revising the maximum in a way that has minimal effects for applications that are using the default. That's, um, 
another issue is can we reduce trimming not based on uh, a specific amount of memory that's available, but if the free list has been over a certain size for a limited time. I'm given to understand that JE Malik uh, has a timer option which allows it to just every second or so, uh, some not very high frequency time, to say, have I got a lot of free memory? Oh yeah, okay, give it back now. But otherwise does not give it back unless, uh, except for on rare intervals relative to application speeds today. So there's, I see some comments in the chat. Let's see. Let me see where the comments start. Uh, there's a mention that um, there are other ways to, to uh, set tunables than the, the ones that I found. It's definitely worth reading the um, documentation on Malik. Don't just go by this presentation. Read the documentation. You'll learn a lot more. And as Carlos says, of course, memory is one of the trade-offs. If you have a highly threaded application, you don't want to go for pure performance because you'll just hang the system when you run out of memory, or at least hang your application with a bunch of e no mem errors. Right, and Carlos comments, as I did, that the uh, dynamic threshold works well in some cases, but it could be smarter in others. Okay, the other comments are well taken. And again, I will, I have, I meant to uh, upload these slides sooner. They are not yet uploaded, but I will upload them today, uh, both for this talk and the previous one. Is there any other comments, discussion? Well, this talk uh, was went smoothly, and I I guess we all get a ten minute break before the next presentation. Go ahead, Ulrich. Right. Yeah, thank you very much, Patrick, for both of your talks. So once again, um, if there is any comments, given that we actually I'm not have hearing you, Ulrich. Anyone else? Go ahead. Carlos. Uh, Can you hear me, Patrick? Check one, two, just making sure you guys can hear me. Carlos, could you talk again? Yep. Can you hear me right now? Recording, reason, check. Yeah, other people say they can hear me. Jason says they can hear me, yeah. Um, no, so if other people can hear me, it's super interesting conversation. Um, I was curious okay, well, if you... I see that... Um... Yeah, um, my question for you, maybe other people can hear it, was... Not, uh, uh, not worked on producer-consumer threaded workloads yet. Uh, yeah. That would be it, a worthwhile area to look. I would expect some of them at least... Uh, could benefit and, from some tuning. And I I I'm think that hear any audio right now for some reason. Uh, Patrick, can you hear us? Which is strange because it worked fine when I was listening to Rude's talk. Patrick, can you hear us? Looks like Patrick still has audio problems. I'm gonna attempt to reset my audio.
check. I think some people can hear me and some people can't. There were issues with BBB when you speak and some people are connected, some people can't hear. Um, yeah, I think the producer-consumer threaded workloads are interesting for glibc's malloc from a performance perspective because when you have uh, free in a thread not matching the original thread, you basically have to go back to the original thread, catch a lock in order to access and put the uh, object into a free list. So what I was super curious, if anybody is, has looked at this or can work on it, is um, a wait-free queue, basically, in the free freeing thread, which is any thread issuing freeze drops the freeze into a WFC on the thread that can hold, that's currently holding the arena lock. And so you basically queue and batch free work in a thread. And we've had someone submit similar work to that. But I would be super interested in anyone in the community having a look at uh, a wait-free queue on the free, free side of the algorithm, which I think might actually be helpful. But that's it. I think, Carlos, you know, for the, the producer-consumer case you're talking about, it is imperative to get good performance that the allocator and the freer be on the same thread and on the same core. <laughs> as soon as you cross that boundary, you've lost. And, 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 I, and I understand we don't have control over those applications, but if they're really going to get good performance, that problem has to be solved. It, that's not even the problem. So those two things, like that's up to the kernel scheduler, I think, to decide that those two threads are touching the same memory and migrate NUMA pages and or migrate based on cost analysis of what's going on with those, uh, those threads. We can't do that. But what I think we can do is that even if you're on one core and you've got both threads on that one core running, um, when you free, the free side has to um, like even if you go into you get lock on the other thread you, you not not thread. even not even so what will happen is normally you go to tcache so what will happen is you'll drop the chunk into the other threads tcache as probably as fast as you can which is the improvements dj made right so you hit the thread mm -hmm. thread local cache and you basically refill the tcache but if what happens in a producer consumer workload is you get producer consumer cases where the consumer is basically just throwing things back at you as work done all the time. Right, so right. quick, quickly the producer's tcash is out of size. So you're then into tuning the tcash size, or you're exceeding the tcash's size limit in which you attempt to catch, you would attempt to take the arena lock. And so my point is that once you're doing the arena lock free, it behooves you to basically queue free work on the producer. So when the producer um, goes to do some work, it has more than just one thing to drop into yeah. the un unsorted queue. So it has a little more work to do. If you're going to take the lock, basically the lock overhead. And once you take it, you're going to aggregate that cost. Correct. And so yeah. some aggregation of that work basically saves you the overhead of having to take the atomic because the CPU has to lock that word. It then has to do the atomic operation on the lock. And then once you're doing that, you might as well do more free work at that point, And then you go yep. back. And so someone, Eric Wong on the list had posted the use of librcu's wfc.h. So wait free queues in the free side. And it was such a beautiful patch. It was like three lines where you just drop in a wait free queue <laughs> on the freer. And then when you do a free, you're just you're just putting a couple of things into the wait free queue and the wait free queue grows and so then the freers all of a sudden they're free the th free threads the basically the consumers are free to just drop the thing into the free queue and go on to the next block of work to do and the mm -hmm. producer has to do a little bit more work and the producer is already doing other things anyway so it there's a balancing act there which would be interesting to see like how long do you allow those re wait free queues to get on the free side or <laughs> um, you you have to start draining them but, but the, the basic concept of, of cue that work for, for the producer so that once he takes the lock, which is expensive, he's getting more work done in terms of training that cue. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes yeah. Sense. So, Patrick, can you hear us? Awesome. You still look like you're in talk mode only, but I'll write some things in the chat.
<laughs> from a UI standpoint, uh, the inability to go back and say, I really want to participate is a lack of that capability is just stupid. <laughs> I, I, I bumped into it yesterday too, and I was like, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> well, I'm really sorry about the, the audio issues uh, on, uh, with Patrick. So, um, but I think it was a very good question, and maybe we can sort of keep the discussion going uh, offline in some, some other forum. So, uh, any, in any case, uh, thank you again, Patrick, for uh, both of your talks. And unless there are other comments on the Malloc, um, I think it's getting close to the starting time of our next scheduled talk anyway. I, I just want to say I really appreciate Patrick's feedback upstream in the community. Patrick, your experience with performance tuning is spectacular. You've schooled me several times in areas where we could do better. Uh, I, I really, really appreciate the time you took to explain to the community certain performance issues, especially when we optimize memcopy for whole system performance versus single thread process performance. So thanks for that.